I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. We'll have a report on the Clarity Project, an innovative approach to helping people with mental health and substance abuse problems. We'll also talk about a new compassionate community response team working with police and fire departments during behavioral health related 911 calls. And we continue our series in Lessons from COVID-19 with the story about the mental health toll the pandemic has had on many of us. These stories and Voices of the Region next on Almanac North. And welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. And as you can see, Denny and I are back together in the studio for the first time in 2021. And it feels good, doesn't it? It certainly does. It's been 15 months since we've been allowed to co-anchor. And it's good to get back in the groove again and hope that folks will continue to tune in. Uh, indeed, and I missed you, my friend. Yeah, good, me too. I missed to you, you too. Thank you very much, Julie. Well, Minnesota legislative leaders are working with Governor Tim Walz now to try to end a log jam before Monday's proposed special session of the legislature. Minnesota's legislative session adjourned in May as the DFL-controlled House and Republican-controlled Senate could not come to an agreement on major budget bills. Now, if a budget can't be reached by June the 30th, Minnesota would be facing a government shutdown. Today marks a major milestone for Saxon Harbor in Iron County, Wisconsin. The harbor opened for the summer season today in a grand reopening and dedication that punctuates a long road to recovery. The marina and adjacent campground at Saxon Harbor was destroyed in a major summer storm in July of 2016. And speaking of storm damage, Duluth celebrated Lake Walk reopened to the public this week in Canal Park. A multi-year, $22 million rebuild of the popular waterfront promenade is complete, save for some final landscaping. A series of storms back in 2017 and 2018 caused major damage to portions of the lake walk, which have now been raised and guarded with huge boulders to withstand future storms. And there's some new monkey business at the Lake Superior Zoo. A black crested Mangamy monkey born at the zoo in May was officially introduced to the public this week. Named Tommy by zoo staff, the cute little guy is one of just 28 black crested Mangabees in the United States and four of them live here at the local zoo. And turning now to our first story, an important expansion of mental health services is moving forward in St. Louis County. Numerous partners are involved in the Clarity Project in response to the growing need for mental and behavioral health and substance abuse services. The county received a $5 million grant to build the Clarity Center for Well-Being and continues to work with community partners to solidify plans for the space. My name is Patrick Boyle. I'm a St. Louis County Commissioner, uh, represent the east side of Duluth. And one of my uh, goals with this program has been since its creation six years ago uh, is to kind of help guide the county uh, working with uh, the state on options of funding and programming. My name is Gina Bossard. I'm the Behavioral Health Director at St. Louis County. And my role with the Clarity Project is to work with providers and bring the project together um, from the beginning to the operation of the building. My name is Diane Holiday Welsh and I'm a consultant for St. Louis County on this initiative. And my role is to partner with Gina and others, um, Commissioner Boyle and, and St. Louis County on the clinical design and the financial performa for this project as we bring it to operational levels. Hello, I'm Katie Anno Freychuk, the Chief Clinical Officer at the Human Development Center. My role in the Clarity Project is to participate in the clinical services planning as we work with the community partners. The Clarity Project uh, basically started about six years ago, and the, the basically the, the folks that formed it were our hospitals, Ascension and St. Luke's, which during that time, uh, they were really having uh, issues with getting inundated with uh, folks going through a crisis, mental health crisis, through their emergency rooms. Uh, and 
really forming a bottleneck of care. Uh, along with that, with having uh, chronic folks, the top 30 users, we call them, that continue to either go through the emergency rooms or uh, through our corrections or jail system. And how could we do a better job of helping these uh, individuals out? Mental health and act- actually emergency department utilization for mental health is a national issue. And I do feel as though we are on the innovative cusp of changing some of the care pathways for individuals where it's not an emergent need. From a medical perspective, there is an emergent need or urgent need for mental health and uh, substance use support, but um, emergency department level of care is not the, the right level of care and not the necessary level of care. So we are creating a new level in our community and to serve not just our own community, but the region. And I think we can help lead the nation in, at some level. We were one of the first to uh, bring a social worker in with our law enforcement in the state of Minnesota, uh, along with now having a nurse and RN working with them. So when we talk about how can we enable and help our law enforcement that don't always have the background in mental health to help them in situations, to defer them from, from going in uh, and having go through the jail setting, it's been a significant help. Along with that, the jails, uh, you know, we've, we've worked with them with medical assistant treatment if they're dual diagnosis uh, and have uh, substance abuse to, to get them the help they need uh, and, and, and to do a warm handoff once they get out of, out of corrections. The Clarity Center uh, really will be the hub when we talk about the Clarity Center. It's the hub in Duluth that will really have a regional service delivery model. And so in our Duluth-based hub, the current plan is to have the Human Development Center as a mental health, behavioral health, substance use provider, along with the Center for Alcohol and Drug Treatment that will assist those individuals in a substance use need. Um, We're also planning a primary care provider, um, a pharmacy relationship, and hopefully a dental provider. We're projecting about 5,400 visits per year of individuals presenting to in need. And that's, you know, again, looking at the historic use of emergency departments along with information provided from our mobile crisis teams and our law enforcement team members and that's considered a conservative projection. We're also looking at the number of visits per year being well over 12,000. In the Iron Range community of Virginia, a compassionate community response team now works with police and fire departments on behavioral health-related emergency calls. It's a new model in the county that could have a positive impact on the community. Here to tell us more is Janice Allen, CEO of the Range Mental Health Center, and Gabriella Gabby Soikinen is an embedded mental health professional with the Virginia (laughs) Fire Department EMS. And thanks to both of you for being here. Really appreciate it. Sounds like a really interesting model that you're working with. And Janice, let let me start with you. Um, Is there a growing number of 911 calls in the region that involves someone who could really use some, some mental health services on site during that call? We have found that to be true, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, with conversations with our EMS and police departments, we found that they could have used some help on those calls, and that's where the partnership started. We did have a training with um, police officers in February. It's called Crisis Intervention Training, and that formulated some of the group that still meets going forward to figure out how to do a combined response and make that sustainable in the communities. Mm-hmm. So what's the value of having this kind of a, a team approach when there's an emergency call? I think it's really helpful for that to be triaged by somebody who has some expertise in mental health who can drive that service to the person and help connect it in the community versus transporting them to an emergency room to be evaluated. Mm -hmm. We can do it on site in the community. And Gabby, you are out on the front lines uh, as an embedded professional. Um, What is that experience like for you? I think it's a really cool experience. It gives me the ability to kind of be out there with them in that moment and a lot of the time it gives me that experience and that opportunity to um, connect them to resources right there without them having to go up to the ER and be sent home before they're connecting to other outside resources in the community. Mm -hmm. As a a mental health professional I I imagine it it is a little bit different um, being out there in the field, the stress, the tension, the 
adrenaline kind of flowing as yeah. you're out there in a, a real life crisis situation. Um, what, how is that different from maybe seeing somebody who comes to your office and, and needs your services? I think one big difference is you're seeing them in their environment. So typically they're coming into my office. When I was doing therapy full-time outpatient, they were coming to me and I wasn't seeing all of those other aspects that happen when they're in the home. Whether that's stressors related to their home conditions or related to their family, their friends, whoever is with them most of the time there's those stressors that you don't see when they come into your office. Mm -hmm. and, and Janice, you mentioned that there was some training that, that you did together. Um, what were some of the, the parts of that training that, that helped maybe all of those partners understand the other's role and what, and what their role is when they're out there in the field? Sure, well, it was meant to be combined a combined response. So we did have some role playing that went on. Mm -hmm. And we saw the law enforcement side and how they approach the things, and then we saw how a mental health worker, when they come in, would, would do things in a different way. And so we saw the value of both of those pieces being present for someone, once for safety and one for um, finding the connection to the resources and taking care of the immediate crisis mm -hmm. in, in the moment. Mm -hmm. How widespread is this approach in, in the state and, and across the country? Is this a model that, that's growing or are, are we really kind of on the cutting edge here? It is growing. I think it's been mm -hmm. in other areas of the country and in the state for a number of years. We based what we do off of the CAHOOTS model from Eugene, Oregon. And we took that and put it and made it fit into what we do in our environment. And then we wanted to rename it so it was valuable to the people that we serve in the communities that we want to reach. Mm -hmm. And it was, and so that's where we came up with the Compassionate Community Response Team. Mm -hmm. And Gabby, are, are you feeling that there are some better outcomes um, with this combined model than there might be otherwise where the situation might escalate, escalate in ways that uh, maybe it shouldn't? I think that we've definitely seen some of those successes, um, even in thinking about the people who are not transported to the hospital when previously that would have been kind of the only option. Um, so, for example, we were able to get one man to a crisis center before um, he was at a level where a hospital could have kind of helped him, um, and that was a really cool success that we had kind of early on with the program was being able to connect him to that right resource without having to go through a whole loop that didn't need to happen. All right, well, Gabby and Janice, thank you so much for coming in and sharing information about this. Good luck thank you as, you, as you work more with the program and kind of flesh it out. Thank, thank you very you. much. Appreciate it. Well, our Lessons from COVID-19 series continues now with a look at mental health during the pandemic. Mental health professionals say much of society experienced trauma during this unusual time as their way of life changed dramatically. It's a story that has played out in thousands of families dealing with grief during the pandemic. I'll say my grandma died right before COVID. Um, so I'm definitely connecting the death of my grandma. She died of Alzheimer's. Uh, I'm definitely connecting her death with pre-COVID because I'm looking at, well, a couple things, how different that experience would have been for myself and my family had it happened a month later and we wouldn't have been able to be with her. Um, we did have to postpone. We didn't get to, we didn't have a service for her like many families today. Uh, hopefully we'll still get to do that at some point. For me, that's one of the ways that I'm considering pre-COVID and when I think of memories. Dina Claybaugh, I'm a psychotherapist and I have been working in community mental health for uh, probably six to eight years or so. Just before the pandemic hit, I had scheduled my very first therapy appointment with a grief therapist. So for a little over a year, I've been in therapy and I've been doing EMDR. And 
wow, just it's it's been amazing. And I can't express enough that people should just take that step forward. It can be as simple as a phone call or asking a friend. Brianne Tepler, and I was born and raised in Duluth, Minnesota. We're currently right now in Quarry Park, which is just about a block from my house in West Duluth off of 59th Avenue. It's been a year, you know, that year um, date is impactful. And so that will continue. I imagine that that's going to be one of the many anniversary dates that will come out of the pandemic. And so to be prepared for that, aware of it, it's okay, it's normal, uh, and to be able to talk about it and memorialize and, and so on is in itself a coping strategy. So for me, Anniversary Effect has tripled the impact. Uh, I lost my father in 2006, my brother in 2009, my other brother in 2018. And what that means is that's three birth dates, three death dates, three times the impact on every holiday, and then every special date in between. So my children's birthdays, I don't have my dad and my brothers with me. So Anniversary Effect for me, what I call that is it's a black dot on the calendar and I could fill the calendar with black dots with you know just that date that date and just mark them all down when I'm not paying attention to the dates I feel them coming I feel that trauma energy my body knows that June 8th is coming up and that's the day that my dad died and I feel it I have felt off and or just unusually sad or really irritated when the pandemic hit I knew a year later, and as we were coming up on that year, we were all going to be experiencing a collective anniversary effect. And it's because when the pandemic hit, I knew we were experiencing collective grief. For me, that's the first time I've had that real every single, no one, no one was spared from COVID. Everyone has been experiencing it. So for me, that's new. Grief wasn't new though. So as we came up on that anniversary, I knew why we were collectively feeling a certain way. While being forced to live in a bubble, we've been forced to live outside that bubble. It's very apocalyptic. It's very scary. It feels like maybe what you would see in the movies. I'm still processing this collective trauma experience because in the world of grief and the process of grief, there's, um, a point where you memorialize, you know, the person who died or the event that occurred, like with 9-11, having um, the memorial, you know, at Ground Zero, which I visited myself, and being able to witness the death and loss and immense trauma of it all is an important part of the grief process. And I will continue to process, you know, how that's going to happen with COVID um, and the pandemic. But I don't know how we're going to do that. Uh, certainly people will be doing that individually as time moves on. How do we do that as a society will be important too. We talk about traumatic experiences in the past. People will say things like, where were you when JFK was killed or we talk about 9-11, uh, where were you that morning? The pandemic didn't happen on one day. It happened gradually, but there were very major milestones that happened. One of them being when the governor said that we needed to shelter in place. That was so final for a lot of people. For me, it was very final. I had a lot of plans with my music, with my kids, with work, and all of a sudden, nobody could do anything. You had to shelter in place, and that's really scary. I think that it's important to have some kind of ritual that brings you closer to the people that you've lost, that gives space for them and gives time for them and your thoughts of them. It's like my song, Too Tired to Cry. I drove 150 miles to go back in time, or I woke up and thought of you to keep you alive. So again, still in this pandemic and the unknowns. 
of it, I think, have created, especially at the peak of it, I mean, an existential crisis. It connects us, when we see so much death, it connects us with our own mortality and depending, you know, on who you are and what you believe, but I, from my experience, this is my life and, and how am I living it and should I be shifting something. It is a collective experience that all of us, I mean, I don't know that anybody in the world isn't impacted in some way. And the way we're finding the ways that people are impacted is so diverse. You know, some people, I mean, some people have lost their jobs. Some people work somewhere where, you know, services have increased and, and the demand has increased, certainly, in, in the world of mental wellness. And, I mean, to not be able to hold a memorial service, to not be able to say goodbye to a loved one who is dying has forced us into a realm of crisis, putting your hands on your heart space and acknowledging the reality of this is a moment of suffering. This is a moment of suffering. Everyone suffers. And during the pandemic, I've said, you know, everyone is suffering in some way right now. This is a collective experience. Next week, our special series comes to an end. In the final segment, we'll visit a homeless shelter on the Iron Range and talk with a former resident. She shared her experience without a roof over her head at a time when folks were being asked to shelter in their homes to try and stop the pandemic. Some people associate homelessness with a drug addiction, and that's not the thing all the time. I mean, all the time. So when people like me who had a rough patch in life, what do we do? Who cares about us? Who, you know, who loves us? And this place just showed me that everything I was missing, everything I was, I was needing and want, you know, and, and without me being able to voice that and tell people this is what I need, they understood me and then went on from there. And then everybody else who has ran up on a rough life patch, you know, and don't know what to do, they shy away from places like that shelter. No, if you need help, you know, come get it. That's all I got, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, don't, don't let the stigmatism or the stereotypes of homelessness follow you, because I would have been dead. Join us as we wrap up our special series next week on Almanac North. Your turn. It's time now for Voices of the Region. Each week we hear from a journalist in our area on the stories they are covering. This week, Marshall Helmberger from the Timber J News in Tower is our guest. recent notification sent by the Federal Environmental Protection Agency to the Fond du Lac Band and the state of Wisconsin, alerting them that the proposed polymet copper nickel mine near Babbitt may affect their downstream water quality. This quote unquote may affect notice, which is spelled out in federal law, is the first step in a process that could eventually lead to modification or invalidation of polymet's federal wetlands permit without which the mine couldn't go forward. The permit is currently suspended pending the results of an upcoming public proceeding, which will include a public hearing which is required by law once the EPA determines that a federally permitted project may affect downstream waters. Now, Fond du Lac officials had urged the EPA under the Trump administration three times in writing to issue this may affect finding, but the EPA declined to do so. Uh, the Fond du Lac eventually sued over the matter, and a court in February found that the EPA had failed in its obligations to the band. 
the EPA with the new administration in place reversed course and agreed to make the determination and go through the proceeding, which is likely to take several months at least. Fond du Lac officials contend that the wetlands permit and other related permits aren't protective enough. That's an argument they've made for years, but up until recently, they've been largely ignored by regulators. They're more optimistic under the Biden administration, which has shown greater willingness to consult with tribes on a variety of issues. We've also been reporting on the fallout locally from a huge spike in construction costs, which have been created by material shortages stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic again. This was supposed to be a big construction year in Ely, but recent bids for the second phase of a $20 million school addition and renovation, as well as a new visitor center and trailhead at Ely's West Entrance have left officials here scrambling to find more funding. The bids for the visitor center came in at twice the engineer's estimates, which were already quite high at $300 a square foot, but the bids came in at the equivalent of a jaw-dropping $750 a square foot, which has put the project on hold for now. City officials there were excited after they had been awarded a million and a half dollars in state bonding money uh, for the project earlier this year, but those dollars are gonna fall well short of what's needed to complete this project. At the same time, the Ely School Board voted recently to reject all the bids it received for a significant portion of its school project, also due to the high price tag. It's definitely a sign of the times. Uh, we're seeing shortages of everything related to building materials, and it's really affecting the construction industry in both the public and the private sectors right now. This week, we're reporting on the continuing disappearance of small town newspapers in Minnesota. This time, it's the International Falls Journal that announced it would be shutting down its operations effective June 24th. The newspaper has been in operation for 110 years, but management of the company indicates that the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and other factors have led to the decision to cease operations. The newspaper was acquired last year by Alden Global Capital, a Manhattan-based hedge fund, which has been buying up newspapers and slashing newsrooms uh, and selling off company assets in a bid, bid for short-term profits, often at the expense of the viability of the newspapers in question. Top management with the company isn't saying much about the decision to close the journal, although it appears the decision was not made locally. As more and more newspapers are being purchased by these big hedge funds like Alden, local decision-making and recognition of the community mission that comes with small town publishing has all but vanished. That's our time this week, but don't forget to follow Almanac North on Facebook and Twitter. You can also visit the WDSE website for program updates, upcoming events, and more information about the station. And if you haven't done it already, download the PBS video app for on-demand viewing of your favorite PBS programs and past episodes of Almanac North. Well, Denny, it was great to be back together with you in the studio. Looking forward to many future shows it's together. It's wonderful to be back. We want our audience to stay. All right. Thanks to our guests and to the crew here in the studio. With Dennis Anderson, I'm Julie Zenner. We'll see you next time.